So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Fagan. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, I, I work for Stardog. I'm a knowledge graph consultant here. I'm based in the UK, actually. Uh, perhaps you saw Naveen's keynote speech yesterday, where he defined what a semantic layer is, and he used the example data set of the British royal family. Um, so I'm going to pick up on that example and take it further to show how to build that semantic model for yourself. So this is a real hands-on demonstration. But during the presentation, we'll also creep up on things like a definition of an ontology and explain what it really is. And uh, we'll also creep up also on what semantic enrichment really means. So if I may, I'll just uh, start. By the way, I should say that you please add questions to the Q&A at any time. And I will, I will, um, I will be able to answer those questions. And uh, if you need to email me, I'm joe.fagan at stardog.com. So joe.fagan, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so let's uh, let's begin the presentation. First of all, we're going to have a quick overview of what an enterprise knowledge graph is. Then I will demonstrate what semantic enrichment means. Uh, with a simple data set. And this is a key value add of an knowledge graph. It, what's, it's what differentiates really uh, in certain aspects. It differentiates what's a knowledge graph from a graph, from a graph database. And then I'll, I'll take Q and A, but please drop your, Q, your, Q, your Qs anytime. So first of all, this is a knowledge graph. Um, so what it really is, it's a data fabric that sits um, between the consumers of the data in your database or your knowledge graph and the data itself. Now, the data itself is usually rectangular data in the form of like relational databases. But we also support semi-structured data like Cassandra and Mongo and things like that, NoSQL databases, and also even uh, text files, um, unstructured data. Our preference is for rectangular data. It's more straightforward to manage. Of course, we don't have to do natural language processing, and we can do it, but uh, so rectangular data is great. So this data fabric sits over all of your data. Well, in the first instance, it doesn't have to sit over all of your data. You can start off with a very small project that maybe just has a couple of tables from a couple of databases and do something really small, maybe like a recommendation engine is a great use case for a knowledge graph. So, so you, you have this layer here that sits over your data. Now, we don't have to ingest the data, so we're just another reader of the data. And when one of your applications or a BI tool touches the data that we would like to see in the graph, at query time, we will go and fetch the data. This is a great luxury to all of the data governance people out there and the people who own the data. They don't want us copying data and they don't want us writing I certainly don't want us writing back to data, which we will never do. So we're just a fabric above the data, like a transparent layer where you can see all of your data. Uh, nothing that we do clobbers any of your existing infrastructure. We just complement whatever is out there. And as you add more and more use cases, you're incorporating more and more of your data. So in that sense, we're unifying your data. Uh, and we'll show in a moment what semantics and inferencing means but we're uni unifying all of your data and your knowledge graph evolves as you add more use cases and add more data sources. And we support a hundred different, we have connectors to a hundred different data sources beneath. And then we can deliver context and rich data to the consumers, which can be an application you develop or we help you develop, or it can be one of our applications like our Explorer tool, which allows you to explore a graph. We can also take data from your database or from your underlying data sources and package it up in, in nice curated bundles using a language called Shackle and hand it to your AI or your ML algorithms. Uh, we integrate with Python and several other languages so that you have access to just any ML library that's available in the Python universe. Uh, in addition, we have a BI SQL layer which means that anything that's in this graph can be presented back as tables again to Power BI or your uh, uh, maybe Tableau or something like that. So this is what a knowledge graph is. It sits in here unobtrusively accessing data, but not just the data itself. It can, uh, excuse me. So let's, what are these things here? Well, they could be uh, customers, individual customers or classes of customers. 
Uh, and the edges could be place this PO order, which is this order detail, which is this product, which comes from this supplier. So just general graph stuff. But it can also be ideas that you have created. So this could be a class of high value customers, or this could be a class of delinquent accounts. The concept of high value customer does, is not in your data, but we can create that as a semantic entity. And then all of these consuming apps can consume data from things that are called high value customers. Um, so there you go. That's that's exactly what our knowledge graph is. So let's just jump straight into a demo. Right. On the demo, what I'm going to do is explain what semantic enrichment really means. And on the way, as I said, we'll creep up on what an ontology is, which is always a burning question for people who are new to maybe not graphs, but certainly new to knowledge graphs. Um, to, to do this, I'm using a really simple data set. And the reason for the simplicity is because mostly, and I had this problem myself when I was new to this thing, when I came, when I wanted to understand ontologies or semantic uh, reasoning or semantic enrichment, either the data set was too complex. And so the clarity of what the semantic enrichment was doing was hidden, obscured by the complexity in the data or the ontology, and we don't know what that is yet, say, the ontology was too complex, it was too domain specific for me, and I didn't understand it. And consequently, it was wasted on me what was going on. But in this case, we're going to use the simplest data set we can imagine. And out of cheekiness, because I'm based in Middle England, uh, the royal family was chosen. And a lot of people know some of the characters here, the rogue Harry and various other people for good reasons and bad. So this is the royal family. Now notice that this little table here is already enriched. It's enriched, uh, of course, with, with autographs, but it's also enriched topologically because we know, because we know about family trees, we know that this means this is the son or parent or child of this. And we know that these are uh, uh, siblings and we know that these are co-parents and we can probably identify cousins and things like that. So it's already topologically enriched. This data does not enjoy such enrichment. Um, and what we're going to do is add more enrichment to it than, than, than you see here. And actually, it's a different type, which is semantic enrichment. Fine. Now, we're all ontologists. This is the reality. Um, here are statements from the data. So if, if I go back to the data, I see that Queen... Charles and King, here's the parent-child relationship. This zero one is trying to capture the fact that in this table over here, zero has child one. So Queen Elizabeth has child King Charles. And if I were to look at say 10, 25 or 26 here, it's telling me that 10 Harry has 25 and 26, Archie and Lilibet as children. So this, this, this is, these are the two tables. This is traditional relational database table. This is what's called maybe a link table or a foreign key table or something like that. It's just standard practice. Okay, so statements from the data are Queen Elizabeth has child Charles, Harry has child Archie. Uh, and notice I'm writing these as triples, uh, subject, predicate, object, because that's the way RDF works. Uh, RDF kind of encompasses the claim that every statement about the world can be captured in this triple format, subject, predicate, object. Now, we can certainly do it for all rectangular data, and I'll show you how. Uh, we can also do it for any statement you can make in English, any statement of fact you can make in English, because that's how we speak, subject, predicates, and objects, clauses perhaps, but nonetheless, the same model. Harry has child Archie is another statement from the data. Now, let's explore statements about the domain of which we speak. We're speaking of families. And here's statements about, which can also be captured in triples. A parent is a person who has a child. A grandparent is the parent of a parent. An uncle is the male sibling of a parent. These are ontological statements. Why are they ontological? Because they refer to the domain and not specifically to the data. I can point those ontological statements at your family tree or my family tree or the royals uh, they still have meaning and they can be applied to that data set. And then knowledge emerges when we deduce things, when we combine this plus this and say, oh, OK, in that case, Queen Elizabeth is the grandmother of Prince William or Harry is the uncle of Charlotte. Now, let's consider this for a moment. 
imagine I'm speaking to my seven-year-old daughter and I tell her that an uncle is the male sibling of a parent as I explain what an uncle is. And later I say, okay, Kira, what is the what is an uncle? And she repeats to me, an uncle is the male sibling of a parent. Well, she could just be another database, another tell and ask system, which is what all databases, including graph databases are. You tell it something, ask it later, and it repeats it back to you. However, if the child says, not an uncle is a male sibling of a parent, if the child, my child instead says, oh, so that means Jack is my uncle. And I say, why? And she says, well, uh, you're my dad and Jack is your brother. So Jack's my uncle. At that point, you have to concede that the child knows what an uncle is because she has taken ontological statements about the domain of families and added it to data that's in her mind um, about her own family. And that is the emergence of knowledge. And if we were, if we were to carry on then, what we're going to do is going to take raw data, uh, create a simple model to capture the data, map the data in, adds, add the ontological rules about grandparents and cousins and things. Then we'll visualize the data and finally democratize the data with semantic enrichment. Democratize simply means make the data available to everybody in the organization, but not just present it to them like maybe with a PDF, but actually give it to them in a way that they can explore in the direction in which they want to explore. And um, that's the true definition of democratized data, which is what our explorer does. Fine. So I'm just going to jump out now and actually go through the motions of, of doing this. This is our this is our startup platform. This is the portal. These are our three apps. Studio is for the more technical folk. It's the integrated development environment where you program in Sparkle and Shackle and all those languages. Um, designer is where we can uh, where we design models, add ontological rules, map in data, ingest data into the database. So that's all the design phase. And then Explorer is the place where we can explore the graph, either the real data, the underlying data, or the semantics that you've created in Designer, and navigate and find out what you want, in addition to being able to write queries without write, using any code at all. So these and this are no code applications. So we will jump straight into Designer. Um, if you have any questions, please can you pop them into the Q and A just to make sure I I can, I, I that this uh, function is working and that you're actually all there? That'd be really good if somebody can just pop in a Q and A for me, uh, something into Q and A. Uh, just say hi, maybe. So Stardog Designer, let's jump in here. A Stardog Designer is where I map and model data. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. It felt like a radio show for a moment. So um, I'm going to. Uh, create a new project, which I'll call Demo R. So I'll create that project. And now the first thing I want to do is add some resources. So I'll choose add resources. Now in a knowledge graph, it, tr traditionally, or especially in our platform, you can either have just files. So we will ingest the data into the database, into the knowledge graph, or we can have virtual graphs. That's the situation where we point the graph at your data sources, like your SQL data sources. And then when you touch the graph, it will go off at query time and grab the data. So this is virtual graph. So if it, I, 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 let's, I'll show you what I mean. So here I'm saying, okay, my data is in SQL. I'm going to tell it which the table is. I'm going to tell it exactly what tables it is. So I can select my tables there, or I can build a custom query and type a select a query here, which will return whatever it returns in a rectangular, nicely shaped format. But I don't want to do that, actually. I want to, just for the simplicity, I'm simply going to add file uh, data from that file that we looked at earlier, which was the members. So I select members. This is my file. I've got three columns. I've got the full name, an ID, and a gender. And I can just create and map that automatically. And the platform will simply say, okay, I think uh, I think what you're trying to do is map. Let's, uh, let's see what it did here. It mapped the full name to the full name. It mapped the gender. These are class attributes here. And these are stuff that's in the CSV file. 
So it created a full name, a gender, and a person ID as attributes to a class, whatever that is. And, and it's grabbing the data from here. And as a label, I'm going to use the full name. The label is what's going to appear at the center of circles when I explore it later. I could choose the ID, but that's a bit unfriendly. Uh, so I'll use the full name. And at that point, I've now just modeled in, you know what, I'm going to change this so that it's less, uh, so that it's not so big. I'll just change its name to M1 to keep things a little cleaner on the on the canvas. Okay, so there we go. This is my mapping that maps from the rectangular data source to the class, which is represented as circles. And I have three attributes, name, gender, and person ID. Fine. The next thing I want to do then is I want to say, well, how am I going to how am I going to capture the fact that a member has a child? which is indeed another member. So what I want to do is add a relationship. So I choose add a relationship. I'll call it has child. And it's going to map from the members class to the members class like this. And I'll just create that as child relationship. Now, very often this would say maybe go from customers to a different class orders or order details. But in this case, the, uh, at the child of a royal family is 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 also a member of the royal family. So we've got this exceptional class which is mapping to itself, which is not unusual. Okay, now I want to populate this relationship. So I'm going to take my link table, uh, and I'm going to find it out here, which is parent child, and uh, have a look at it. And again, it's exactly the same data. So Harry is child, Lilibet and Archie. And I'm going to create that resource. And now I'm going to add a mapping and call that mapping two. Normally in a big project, you'd name these much more carefully, but this is such a small project, I can't go wrong. And then I can either snap it to a member, but I really want to populate this edge, these edges between instances of members. Uh, and I'm just going to set, tell it how to create those edges. So this is the edge that's going to go from the member class to the member class. And I want to find the parent at this end of the relationship and the child at the other end of the relationship. The direction is from left to right. So it will, it will end up saying that the guy with the parent ID has a child, the child ID, which is exactly what we wanted. So we'll have 10 has child 25. All right, okay, so that's our entire mapping. So now we've mapped a data set. You know, you could have 30 tables and this is how simple it is to to map your tables into classes in your in your database. I could publish that immediately, um, which I'll do now. I'll just give it a name, say uh, demo or, and create that as a, as a database. And then I'll just, just accept all the, all the um, defaults. And now I have created a database called demo or, these are resources about this design that I can submit to my source code control system or sh share with other people. And now I want to go into Explorer and have a look at the data. Notice I've got little or no semantic enrichment, let's say no semantic enrichment yet. Although I did make decisions like I decided the edge was called has child, for instance. So this is my data. Now let's have a look at Harry and see what we know about Harry. In fact, we do have a Harry. And here's all we know about him, his full name, his gender. He has a child from left. No, by the way, we can see the triples clearly here if we just squint. So the triples are Harry Duke of Sussex has full name, Harry Duke of Sussex. This guy has gender M, has child, Archie has child a little bit. And these notice that they reverse direction here. So edges have directions. So this edge really says Diane has child Harry and King has child. And that's the way the edges work. Um, so there we go. That's all. And then we can populate the graph, like just throw it up into the graph. And indeed, we have the parents have child Harry and we have Harry has child Harry's own children, Lily, Beth and Archie. That's what a graph database does. We want to say, OK, well, how are we going to how are we going to uh, complement this now and turn it into a knowledge graph so we can go back into designer and imagine there's a part of your organization that doesn't like the term has child and would much prefer to use has parent. Well, we can do that. We can add another relationship and we'll call it has P for um, has parent, um, if I could spell. And then again, it's going to map from parent members to members and I can create it here. Now, how am I going to populate this? I can create a rule. So we're going to create a rule for has parent. 
just call it as parent. And we're going to say, if a member has a child, actually, let's do it in the other direction, has a child, another member, member two, new instance, member two. So member one has child member two. Then what do I want to infer? I want to infer that member two, that member two has parent member one. And already I've added my first little bit of semantics to a graph because now we can, one part of your organization might want to see as parent, even though it doesn't appear anywhere in your data. And we can get richer and richer. Imagine if we wanted to say, for instance, th uh, think about uh, things like maybe siblings. Let's, let's create a, a has sibling relationship. A sibling is a brother or sister. It's a word we use commonly in England, but I'm not sure it's used commonly elsewhere else. So I'm going to create a has sibling. Now, what would a has sibling rule be look like? Um, well, let's let's go into our rules and create a has sibling. So I'll create a rule for has sibling. So I'm going to say, okay, how am I going to find my siblings? I, I'm going to I, I'm going to be me. I have a parent. My parent's name is say Anna. And my parent, which is member two, my parent has a child. So member two, my mother, say, has a child. And that's member three. And you're a new instance. So now this is me. I have a parent. Her name happens to be Anna. Anna has a child. So this must be a sibling of mine. And so I can infer that member one has sibling. Um, has sibling uh, member three. And there we go. And then we save that and we've got a, a rule for a sibling. I mean, I could flog this to death and say add cousin. So um, if you're open, oh, we have questions. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, Starlock. Hey, great. We're all here. Great. Uh, thank you. Do customers use pre-built ontologies or build their own? That's a great question. The, the question is, do customers use pre-built ontologies or use their own? We could certainly uh, use pre-built ontologies. There are actually family uh, family ontologies out there that describe cousins and uncles and first cousins once removed, we could certainly use them and ingest them into the database for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, we can use, we can do it that way or you can start from scratch. It's entirely up to you. For certain industries, there are very established ontologies. Uh, people use the same lingo, the same language, and you can use that ontology. For instance, let's say the restaurant business or the cooking business has the definition of what a recipe is. It is a definition of what preparation time and cook time is. So it's good if you use what the world has converged on as what recipe means and prep time and cook time and serves and all of those things. But the answer is you can use both. Fine. So we're going to create one more thingy, which is going to be a cousin. So we'll say uh, as a cousin. Um, and because we're so smart with these things now, we can probably figure out what a cousin is going to be. Um, so a cousin. So let's uh, create a rule for cousin. Um, and I create a rule for as cousin. I'll just call it as C. So what is a cousin? So I'm going to start with me. I have a parent. My mother. Um, notice that I'm already using semantics that are in my ontology that are not in the data already. I'm using that. And in that, that's how the, the complexity, let's say, grows in spite of the simplicity of the individual layers of the of the complexity. So I've got a so this is a, I have a parent, that's my mom. And my mom has a sibling. So I'm going to say member two is my mom, and she has a sibling, which is, you don't know this, but that's my uncle James. And that's a new member, new instance. So this is James. And James is a child. So member three has a child called Colette. Uh, so a new instance. So member one is, so Colette and I are cousins, because this is my mom. My mom is a sibling. A sibling is a child. So can I now, by the way, when I infer, I can either infer class membership. Oh, excuse me. I don't know what that is. Let's move that out of the way. So I'm going to say that member one has cousin, has cousin member three. Um, or excuse me, member four. So let's save that. 
Right now, so let's let's uh, let's publish all let's publish all this to our existing database. So nothing needs to change. I go to the say back to the same database, publish everything, and um, I say next and publish. And now, if I go back into Explorer, and uh, this is, I'll, I'll have to hit refresh here and see what we know about Harry now. Okay, so we have exactly the same as we had before, but. That is because all of those additional things that I created, I used reasoning and inferencing for. So I'm going to switch on reasoning and have a new look at Harry. And now we can see that Harry has those six cousins. He has these uh, uh, children. Um, he has these siblings. And he has, uh, the, his parents are such and such. So if we if we just view the details on Harry now, you remember what you saw before, and now you have all of this information in addition. And I remind you that this is created on the fly. The reason it's created on the fly is that you can point it to any data in your organization. As the data changes, as soon as you hit the query, it will already have the cousins in place. So we don't pre-run the data pre-run the rules, pre -run, that's just, it's too much uh, execution work. It's creating new data that we don't need to hold on to. We could materialize all these facts, but they're created on the fly. And that is precisely what semantic enrichment means. Fine, Other, do I have another question? No, I don't. Okay, so let's get back to our enrichment data. Uh, perhaps actually I could show you other things that you can do in Explorer. So I can write queries, for instance, say I wanted to find I don't know, let's say the female, the granddaughters of Charles. In the same way as I build rules, I can build queries. I might even have one here. I do. Look, here's the granddaughter of Charles. So I am, I'm proposing I'm going to be a granddaughter of Charles. Of, uh, so I, I have a, a parent called two. Two has a child called three. So this is my grandparent. Uh, the grandparent's name is Charles. And I have gender female. And when I run that, I will find the grandparents, the granddaughters of Charles, who are Lilibet and Princess Charles. And having done that, having created that query in that way, I can use this as a rule and just have a rule called the granddaughters of. So, it, so running the queries and running the rules are, are creating the rules are extremely, extremely similar. Uh, and of course, I can view that data in the graph as well. So I have Charles as a child who has a grandchild and so on. Right, let's get back to the semantic. Let's get back to, so uh, let's consider what we've done first of all. We've taken the raw data. We created the schema, which is really simple. It was only, we only created the class members and we created the has child. That was the original schema. And then when you add some enrichment to the schema, like the ontological statements, suddenly we take on this fancy word ontology. Ontology and schema are almost the same. Ontology is just a kind of fancier word for, for the schema. And then we visualized it. Um, now, I, I encourage you to look back here. And if we I go into this mode, I just want you to squint at this for a moment and imagine that you're in a supply chain environment. Then these could be mega warehouses at which products arrive. These could be transmission ways of, of uh, delivering uh, products to maybe sub warehouses or distribution centers. And these could be moms and pop shops at the end. If I were to also join the cousins to, or the second cousins once removed, then you could see that I would have multiple paths from any so from a source to a destination. And we could talk about shortest path. Uh, the paths could be weighted with either the cost to get there or the distance of miles or the time. And we could talk about shortest path from a particular mega store to a particular mom and pop shop. We could also talk about resiliency and redundancy in the network. We could ask, well, what if this particular sea ferry port was knocked out of action? Can I still get can I still get uh, products to my customers? Uh, if you're in the manufacturing business, you could think of these perhaps as being this. This is a, a component like an IC and this is a, a chip and there's a process to put the chip. And, the, and this is a, a cable loom, a loom of cables. And all of these come together into a sub assembly, which is a power supply, which rolls up into a 
rolls up into maybe a television or something, a product. Uh, so the concept of siblings now become uh, the concept of shared um, uh, 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 of shared raw material in a subassembly. Uh, if these are uh, devices that fail out in the field with a common mode, maybe this is a and this is a common mode failure, then the question, although it doesn't look like an ancestry question, the question is really asking, who is my who is my uh, closest shared ancestor? So all of these family type questions can be turned into questions about delivery networks and, and and so on and so forth. So with just with the smallest amount of imagination, just th this can be anything you can imagine. I'll give you one more example. Imagine this is a compound called brewer's yeast. And in this graph with millions of nodes, way over here, we could have a disease called maybe multiple sclerosis. And it might be that this compound affects this gene uh, expression, which expresses, which, you know, uh, controls this protein folding that affects a, I don't know, a, a cell, maybe a, a nerve fiber cell, which is the disease multiple sclerosis. Now having, this is a real example where a customer found some data to show, a pharmaceutical customer, to show that there was a correlation between a brewer's yeast and a remission in multiple sclerosis. And you can imagine all of the experts that were needed that go from the compound to the gene expression, to the folding, to the nerve, to the, you would need so many uh, experts to try to carve away. And this was found with a simple shortest path query. So there, that's the kind of magical things that graphs can do. Um, and and like, like for imagine example, for instance, we're in a, these are, this is insurance claims for car accidents. So uh, this person bumped into this person or whatever. So imagine three of us were in this, in this coot. So me and Jack and Jim, I crash into Jack who crashes into Jim who crashes into me. We just become overconnected, especially maybe we all share the same physiotherapist or something. You would expect that people in this graph would be separated, uh, you know, in a kind of a normal distribution kind of way. Whereas if we're in a fraud ring, we're overconnected. And those sorts of overconnectedness can be detected in graph databases and knowledge graph databases in ways that are practically impossible uh, for SQL databases. There's no way to say to a SQL database, tell me things that are overconnected, uh, because you need to know what you're asking before you ask, uh, whereas overconnected is a general idea rather than a specific um, about who crashed into whom. Same with fraud, same with the uh, recommendation engines. All of these things rely on, on, on data to be laid out in this way. And if on top you have semantic and semantic enrichment, then everybody's a winner. OK, so um, that more or less ends my presentation as such. And uh, so I'm just going to jump into query time. I could add that I used exactly that uh, ancestry to answer a really complex question for a manufacturing process. I won't describe it in great detail, but it was complex. And you'd end up with uh, the output um, had several ancestors, which were called samples in the system. Uh, the customer wanted to see the hierarchy. Uh, or the traceability of, of who are the ancestors, his, his limbs, as it's called, lab information management system was unable to tell him. And by just mapping his data in, um, helping with him his ontology, mapping them both together, we were able to produce the best traceability that his particular industry has ever seen, according to him. And I use no code to do it. That's the uh, magic of um, semantic enrichment and knowledge graphs. And of course, the no code tools that for the first time ever really have given non-technical users access to not just access to knowledge graph, but building the models, building the rules, building the ontology. And uh, everything that I've done here, although I did it on a simple data set, can be applied to your data set with a little bit more of subject matter expertise from you uh, and a little bit more ontological help from us to, to capture how you make the statements. Uh, one of our pharmaceutical companies in his ontology is able to, he makes both lubricants and things. He makes lubricants and things that explode when you put a match to them, like gasoline and things. And he just wanted to know, well, what, if I throw an entity, is it combustible or not? Just really simple questions like that, which we can, as soon as we uh, point at a chunk of data, 
we can separate out the combustibles from the non-combustibles. Okay, so I have some questions. How do we add new terms or relationships to the semantic layer? Well, uh, the question is, how do we add new terms or relationships in the semantic layer? Well, we saw that a couple of times. If you remember, what we did in designer was we added has cousin and has sibling. So that's how we, we add it has cousin. That's how we add it. Uh, uh, could be the best presentation I've ever seen. Great. How? Oh, thank you so much. That's um, that's uh, really nice of you to say. Thank you. How often can Stardog pull your data sources for new updated data? Okay. Well, that's a great question. So, how often will we pull the data? Uh, there's two answers. One is in the simplest cases, we only touch the data when you make a query to the graph. So we will grab the most up to date data. That's the first answer. So we we won't poll at all, we'll grab the data at query time. That's the first answer. The second answer is sometimes you may not want us to disrupt your original source data every time somebody queries the graph. So what we can do is we can put another star dog cache node in between and say, I want to update, you know, I don't want to trouble the mission critical database with my petty little knowledge graph query. So maybe every morning at 5 a.m. we will do, a, we will grab the data and cache it. So now the knowledge graph will be polling or grabbing the data from the local cache instance while the mission critical uh, application is left undisturbed. Of course, the consequence is you're getting day old data so not great for online transactional processing, but great for analytics and uh, machine learning and all those other things. So that's that's how often we pull your data. You can say do it every hour, do it every half hour, do it every week. Um, now, let's see, do customers, yes. Uh, can other people see and use rules I create? Or are they only for me? The, the rules are not for you. The rules are in the database. Okay, so they're in the database. So I created one model for all of this data. I could have created a separate model for different, I could have a separate model for HR and a separate model for manufacturing. So the data stays the same, but say the HR has the has cousin relationship and has parent and manufacturing has the child and another class of, I've created a new class of grandparents. So different parts of your organization can have different models, different views of the data. So to answer your question, you can keep it private if you like by just not having anybody uh, share it uh, in a named graph. And we have role-based security. So you could say, this is my model. I'm the only one allowed to use it. But normally here in Explorer, when you when you hear, you're saying which model you want. And I only have that one model that I created. We could have 10 models. We could have the HR view of the data. We could have the French people's view of the data. So it'd be mama and pair and grandpair and all that instead of parents. So we could have language specific uh, views of exactly the same data. Okay. Um, you can get started with start. Indeed you can. Uh, so I think um, we've got about one minute left and I've answered a lot of the questions there. It's been a real pleasure if I may say so, and I'll drop my email here and it would give me great pleasure to take any of your questions um, that I haven't taken, or if you think of something later or just want to reach out, please do so. It'd be my pleasure to um, to engage with you further. So uh, if you have one last question, I've got, um, oh, here we go. How long does the deployment for an initial use case typically take? That's a great question. It, uh, we can, I have done jobs for customers who are having trouble with um, tables in a relational database and they, they were having trouble with queries, especially recursive type queries. They're just difficult, like the, sometimes impossible. You can take a simple data set with maybe three or four tables um, and create a model, map the data and start answering queries literally in 30 minutes. Um, and then, you know, as you add more and more use cases and add more and more data, it's going to take longer as complexity grows. But anything from 30 minutes and for a very complex install, for a very complex model, maybe a, a whole business information model for your whole organization that has got everything from customers, clients, to-do lists, right down to the menu in your cafeteria. We can do something like that in about six weeks is what we would normally uh, uh we would not 
normally reserves about six weeks for a really complex case. My LinkedIn profile, um, sure, I'll, I'll grab my LinkedIn profile. Uh, I will, if, if you drop me an email, I'll send you, or actually you could stop sharing and then I could grab my LinkedIn profile. So I'll do that right now. Uh, one second, please. Um, and then we'll, if you have no more questions, I will uh, immediately try hard to find yourself on LinkedIn. Okay. Okay, I found it. Answer live. There you go. Actually, I'll drop it in chat because I can't seem to. There we go. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to end the demonstration. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.